Here is uh, Gordon Neufeld, a couple of quotes. He's not dead, but he looks like it. He, um, I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. He's a psychologist out of Vancouver who's done some beautiful stuff around attachment and connection. And some of the things he says that really matters to me, uh, one is collect before you direct. And so if you are going to remember anything before you leave, uh, when you leave here tonight, it's two things. Number one, hands in the circle. In order to teach a kid emotional regulation, you only need to have your hands in the circle 30% of the time. You can screw this up 70% of the time and still assist your kids in regulating emotion because we have so much stuff on our own plates that we are not going to be able to stay regulated. huh? So the good news is 30%. Huh? Lovely. So you can say things like the whole brush your teeth deal, right? You can be on your game. You can be like, babe, it's time to brush your teeth. It's time to brush your teeth. It's time. My love, look at me. You need to brush it. Not your brother. No, no, baby. Not the dog. Brush your teeth. And then you can say, brush your teeth. That's your 70%. <laughs> and it's like an average, so you can dip into the 20s. <laughs> this is perfect. See? What becomes really critical in this process is repair. See, kids never understand how to say their story unless we do it with them. Yeah? The biggest difference between couples who make it and couples who don't in marriage is the capacity to repair. Not how much you fight, but your capacity to come in and say two words, I'm sorry. You don't know how to do that if somebody hasn't done that for you. Yeah? An apology is not ever followed by a but. And with our kids, we do this all the time. I, mommy's sorry, but if you wouldn't act like such a little jerk, I wouldn't need to yell at you, okay? That undoes an apology. You might as well never have said I'm sorry, because you're not sorry. You're sorry predicated on something else. The other thing that is not an apology is when we say, I'm sorry you feel that way. That is also not an apology. That's a shaming response. We wouldn't be here if you weren't such an idiot, but I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that is not an apology. An apology is, I'm sorry. End of story. Yeah? So if you want your babies to be able to give that away to you or to somebody else in their world, you got to give it to them when you're sorry. And we all screw up, see? There are many opportunities for you to apologize to your children, to your partners, Having them watch you do it with dad, with mom. Sometimes after my husband and I have an argument in front of the kids, I say to him, and we make up elsewhere in the house, like not weird, but just like, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, I say, let's go, let's go do this in front of the kids. Let's say I'm sorry. He's like, oh my God, seriously? Like, I thought we're over this. We're not? I'm like, yes, we are, but we just need to do this in front of the kids, like just so they can, he's like, Jesus. So I'm like, hey, mommy would just like to say, daddy, I'm really sorry. And he's like, okay, good. <laughs> no, no, just a second. Your father doesn't understand this process. Just a minute. <laughs> Daddy, what would you like to say to me? You're welcome. <laughs> no! So, it, like, it doesn't always go as planned. You should probably do, like, a little rehearsal before. <laughs> but this 30% thing is, is really kind of, uh, it's an elusive number. Uh, Circle of Security guys came up with it in their first book, and they don't repeat it in their second book. They say that that number is quite elusive, but I am hanging on to that mother pack and statistic for the rest of my life because it is the only thing that keeps me in the game uh, when I'm losing my mind, which I do quite regularly. Um, so this collect before you direct, why, which, this is really critical. The second thing I, I want you to remember is this collect before you direct. What I'm talking about is put a prefrontal cortex on before you give a direction anytime you can, which means I need to get you in the game with me. I know this is tough. I'm, I'm so sorry. Tell me more. All right. I'm going to get your prefrontal cortex back on, and then we're going to talk about it. Two very important factors in this process. It is not just keeping a kid quiet. It is getting a kid to be calm. And there's a big difference between kids who are quiet and kids who are calm. Kids who are quiet play the iPad all day long. They sit in a principal's office, play the iPad. Nobody sees. It doesn't cause any problem. Nope. Mm -mm. Calm kids actually flip their lids a lot. Because I know how to then teach you how to get back down, or they get back down themselves. Right? This makes me so mad. <sighs> yeah? That's a kid who has the capacity to calm, right? Big difference between quiet and calm. So this idea of collecting before you direct really matters. And when you can turn their mad to sad, then you're getting somewhere. 
And angry, you see, we get, we get very concerned about anger in our society. We have anger management programs everywhere. Mad is just sad's bodyguard. Behind every mad is a sad. And when I have the capacity to say enough times, tell me more. I know, buddy. Shut up, I hate you. I am. Yeah. I get it. What would happen if I say, hey, that's not a good choice. You don't tell your mother to shut up. What's going to go on with their lid? It's going to flip. And it is not the time to teach yet. You don't ever tell your mother to shut up. That's not okay. It is not if I'm going to have that discussion, it's when. When I have collected you, when we're sitting down having a snack, I can say, buddy, here's the thing. That was a tough. Because I know then I have a prefrontal cortex. That's who I'm going to teach. Yeah? How do you get a kid's lid on? How do you get their heart? You know this. If you came into my house and my kid was losing their mind, I'm upstairs drinking wine saying, I'm going to kill, like, seriously. They have just destroyed the basement. You know what to do this uh, with anybody else's kid. You'd be like, okay, okay. Let me, I'm just going to go check it out. You wouldn't come down the stairs and be like, listen, this is inappropriate choices. You're in the red. You might say things like, Hey, dude, what's going on? Hey, you got pop. This is pop. Do you like Lego? Huh? You would sort out where this kid is so that you could get a prefrontal cortex back on, right? So you would do things like showing genuine interest in things you could care less about. Yeah? This is what you do to get a kid's prefrontal cortex back on, right? You start talking about Paw Patrol, things they love. If they're older, you do this more often than not, right? If you feel like you're disconnected from your babe, get to know what they love. Not what you like, not what you want to talk about. What do they love? Yeah? They always have earbuds in their ears. Ask them what they're listening to. You say things like, hey, just going to download a new track on my Walkman. <laughs> do not say that. <laughs> but you can say things like, who are you listening to? And they'll be like, never mind, Dad. It's like a rap group. They swear. That's okay, dude. Like, I can, I can handle it. Who are you? Who, who are you listening to? They're the insane clown posse. Ooh. You could say things like, wicked. <laughs> and this thing is very important. I don't know exactly what it means. There's probably a bad thing in... But do this a lot. And then you say, hey, can play me your favorite song. And they'll be like, no. You'll be like, yeah. And so when they hand the earbud over, do not put it in your ear because you'll get a disease. But you are going to say... When you hear on the other end, Mata, ba, ba, da, da, you're going to do this. <laughs> so good, buddy. So good. It sounds like um, Fishing in the Dark. Have you heard that song? <laughs> Just like that. And then it's going to open it to more conversations. You're going to say things like, is there, is there a lyric sheet? Like, wh what, what exactly are they saying? <laughs> And you can say things like, you know, have you seen them in concert? Like, should, maybe we should get tickets. Like, are they allowed to leave their country? <laughs> it opens up uh, so much possibility, you know? And you talk to them about things. You know, what is cool now? You get them to teach you about Instagram and Snapface and all of those things. <laughs> and you plead ignorance. You'd be like, let's take a selfie and, like, let's make the, the fire come out of our mouth. Come on. Ah. Ah, get in here. Come on. Ha. And they'll be like, Mom, God. That's exactly what you want, yeah? Because you know the most vulnerable emotion on the planet. What is it? Joy. You are at your most vulnerable when you are in joy. We dress for her's tragedy all the time. We are wired to prepare for the worst. You cannot simultaneously hold two emotions in your mind. So when you are preparing for the worst, what are you missing? Yeah, the joy. So when families are really struggling, I say then to them, like, when is the last time you danced in your kitchen? When is the last time you belly, you belly laughed with your babies? When is the last time at bedtime, instead of losing your freaking mind because they're 30 minutes late, everybody's farting and joking, just lay down and fart too? They don't know what's happening. They're like, mom's loaded. <laughs> Just kidding. That never happens in my house. 
But that becomes really, this getting their eyes thing, eye contact becomes a really important thing. People say, you know, you have to be careful about eye contact. Culturally, there's differences. Uh, here's the thing, every culture on this planet makes eye contact. That is how we socially reference to know where I stand with somebody else. So eye contact, th these are the window to the soul, see? When you've known somebody who has anxiety or depression, where are their eyes? Down. When you are in your deepest state of grief, where are your eyes? Yeah. When you are, uh, walk through the halls of many high schools, where's the hoodies? Where's the hair? Because when you are confused about what's going on behind here, you don't show those to anybody. Yeah? And the answer to that, when somebody is grieving, is not to say, look at me! Huh? It, it's not about an anti-hoodie policy. It's not about cut your hair, that's a bad choice. It's way more about tell me more. What's going on? What am I missing? What are you worried about? Yeah? Again and again and again. And those opportunities to find times to have those conversations becomes important. In the car, bedtime, when you're feeding them. Because you cannot chew with a flipped lid. When is the last time you were just so mad you wanted a sandwich? <laughs> you cannot physically chew and swallow and be like ready to throat punch somebody. You're not just like, like that, right? And you're not also like at a funeral sobbing in the corner like, Mah! like that, like slamming the open face egg buns. Because you can't, you would choke. So when you were flipped, you cannot eat. So when I, I have food in my office, in my car, in my purse, every, all the time, because that is the quickest way I can get a kid to regulate, yeah? If they've lost their language altogether, have you ever had one that's like um, one, like they're, anyway, have you ever ha had a child who is like lost their language, they're so uh, dysregulated, right? They, they're just punching things or they're hissing or growling, get very primitive, like, Ehh! Like that. Don't hiss back. That's not a good choice. <laughs> Don't mirror the behavior. Uh, because when they lose their language, you need to lose yours. They have no access to process their own words, so they will not process yours. So no matter what you say, like, okay, this is, uh, you were, you're very angry. Okay, this is very, listen, you need to calm down. You need to, you know, when you've been so mad, you just want to punch somebody. And people are like, chihuahua-ing. What do you want to do with them? Throat punch them. So just shut up. Stay present, huh? Because you need somebody in proximity. If it's not safe to be right near them, I always say, I'm not going far, baby. I'm not, get out. Cool, I'll get out, but I'm not going far. You can't regulate alone. You need somebody in the process. Is there time for space? Absolutely, but I'm never far, okay? Because you can't regulate on your own. Your lid can fall on when you threaten abandonment. Smarten up or mommy's leaving. That works good, doesn't it? I use it all the time, in Walmart particularly. Uh, but the, is you got 70%, see? So you, so you can throw that out quite a bit <laughs> in the moments where you need it the most. Uh, because this is very sad about this. We, we all, uh, abandonment is our deepest fear. Every single one of us, because we're wired for connection. We will not survive if we are abandoned, yeah? So that triggers in all of us a capacity for the lid to fall back on that does, what, you have given them nothing to give away other than I'm gonna operate out of fear, which is how Donald Trump uh, is running a country currently uh, because that is how he's been taught, yeah? He was raised in military college. He was, uh, by uh, eight years old, he was punching teachers uh, out in the face and his mom and dad had no idea how to assist him in regulating emotion, yeah? So they got meaner. And then at 13, he was so out of control that they sent him to a military college where he spent the rest of his formative years. So he's running a country the best way he knows how, which is to get bigger and stronger. Yeah? Might is right. Yeah? And you, we're doing the best we can with what we got. That's, that's all of us. Yeah? Is it enough? Probably not for the American people. Um, but that, ne never mind. This is, I could talk about that shit for all day. <laughs> okay.